Julianne Smith, welcome to the Institute, and also I have to say uh, the most the newest, freshest member of the Board of Trustees. Thank you very much. Thank you. 25th anniversary of German unity. I'll bet you know where you were on the 9th of November, 1989. I'll bet I don't. I was in Paris. You were in Paris? Yes. Oh. I was studying okay. uh, abroad, and I remember thinking to myself, history is in the making over there. You didn't go uh, to and I did. I took my French degree about a year later and moved to Germany. And the rest is history. Uh, history. And now I'm a Germanophile, uh, <laughs> in addition to speaking some French. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I remember thinking I need to be a little bit closer to the action. I was fairly close, could have been here in Washington. But, no, I was yeah. here in Washington. I was crossing the T Bridge. Is that right? Going home at night and I was thinking, wow. Look, what we're look at this breaking there. news, yeah. 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 But in any event, we're 25 years later now. And I think that, as you well know, what we do here is we talk about what's ahead. And that's what we want to talk about. In other words, when you look back and say, in all honesty, and I can vouch for this on my own, I didn't know this was heading. I didn't know this was going to happen. The old mantra was, this will never happen in my lifetime. But now we're 25 years later. And so the question I would want to raise with you is, what have we learned on both sides of the ocean? What are we still learning? And uh, if you want, uh, what adjustments still have to be made? And I'm not just talking about Germany, I'm talking about both sides of the equation. But you pick up either side of it. Start out with. So this is an amazing story. Uh, and you're right, none of us saw it coming. And no one knew what to expect. I think Washington had somewhat high expectations. We knew our little brother was growing up. Uh, we had had a terrific relationship with Germany for many years. But we weren't exactly sure how this would all unfold. And we knew that Germany would be heavily focused on its internal affairs for all the obvious reasons. But we were hoping over the medium and long term we would see an even stronger bilateral relationship, a stronger position for Germany inside Europe, and a more dynamic role for Germany on the world stage. And I think in many ways we've seen all of those come true. Okay. U.S.-German relations are very strong. We're having highs and lows. We've had our disagreements to be sure. But really the fundamentals are there. Uh, Germany's place in Europe is secure. Germany's providing just indispensable leadership across Europe right now. And then the chapter that we're still witnessing and waiting for is kind of Germany's place in the world more broadly. And Germans themselves have done a lot of thinking on this. But I think Washington's hope is that it will assert itself. It will take on a stronger leadership role. I think in terms of going forward, what we both need to focus on is the future of the liberal order. We collectively have spent, with other partners in Europe, the better part of 60 to 70 years creating this very rich array of international organizations. And none of them are suited to deal with today's threats. And so the question for us going forward is, what kind of world do we want to see going forward? How are we going to join forces to update these institutions, make them better equipped to deal with new challenges, and make them stronger to respond to the likes of Russian aggression in Crimea or Chinese aggression in the South China Sea? But they also have to be more inclusive. Countries are right to point out that they weren't present at the creation. And so for Europe and the United States, we have to think about how do we update this system that we've invested so much in, but still ensure that it reflects and represents our values. It's interesting that you talk about updating, in other words, 2.0, 3.0. Um, let me ask you to remember the context of the speech of May 1989, George Herbert Walker Bush in Mainz, before German unity is even a twinkle in people, some people rise. And he's saying partnership and leadership. I remember being there, and I remember the Germans running in the other direction saying, wait a minute, first of all, we don't like the word leadership, and second of all, what do you mean? I mean, we're a divided country. We now, in my view, in some ways, have leaders in partnership, which is not exactly always a formula for frictionless relations. Right. So when you look at that and you say to go to 2.0, to go to 3.0, what adjustments have to be made on both sides of the equation to update that operating system? Well, I think for the United States, we have to understand that 
our partners don't always have to agree with us and we're going to have many instances where we are going to see the world differently and just because we have a solid foundation doesn't mean that we can't have disputes over things like Libya or NSA surveillance or how to combat climate change or how to deal with uh, fiscal challenges but fundamentally we have to find a way to row together and figure out how to seize on the unity that we do have to solve an array of global challenges but it's been an interesting development I mean for years I think the United States felt like it kind of had the upper hand in the relationship and now it's more of a relationship of equals in many ways uh, and so that's been an evolution and I think it will continue to be an evolution going forward when you think about it, I mean you've been inside the machine you work the Defense Department you were in the White House you You've seen the way people have had to adjust. And I gather when you do that, Julianne, correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you can't have a very long view. You worry about the next hour, if, 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 if not the next day or week or month. But is it the fact that the, let me put it this way, this question, is the expectation in your world that you worked in and that world you're here with, is the expectation of what Germany ought to do greater than it was 25 years ago? And if so, is that a good thing? Even if the Germans are saying, well, maybe not in all cases are we going to agree with you. Is that, is that what's going on? Grow, growing expectations here and Germany changing its expectations of itself over there. Yes, it's ultimately a good thing. I mean, of course, we don't enjoy moments when we have deep disagreements and we can't line up with each other and stand shoulder to shoulder. But ultimately, we want a strong capable, confident partner in Berlin. And by and large, I think we see that. There are areas where we'd like to see more. We'd like to see an even stronger defense. Uh, we'd like to see um, a little bit more engagement in areas far beyond Europe's borders. We'd like to have a stronger dialogue about Asia. Um, but I think given the choice, policymakers today would rather see that strong partner in Germany that sometimes disagrees with us rather than a partner that waits for a signal from Washington on what to do and where we should go and leaves us in the driver's seat. I mean, of course we enjoy leadership and we like being in the driver's seat, but we need capable partners. The world is incredibly complex. It's overwhelming. When you're a policymaker, you feel like you're just drowning in one crisis after the next and because of that you want to be able to turn to other countries and say you've got to take this one we can't do this all ourselves and so to the extent that Germany is going to become more capable and more willing to take the lead ultimately I think in the big picture Washington would welcome that if you look at Europe in 2015 you see one person who's been in power for 10 years if you look around the rest of the orbit, and it isn't very prevalent, that particular uh, you know, fact. So by definition, Germany is in a situation where it's had more continuity than in other countries. And particularly, I want to throw in England here, because mm -hmm. everybody's worried about yeah, yeah. the way the UK is moving. But in that sense, I think that the US sees and it looks across the ocean. I made a joke about the fact that when you look for that number that Kissinger wanted to add, that the area code is not 3-2 for Brussels, but 3-0 for Berlin. Do you think that's the case? <laughs> I know that's the case. Uh, yeah, I live that each and every day. I mean, of course, we still turn to Brussels. We have to because the EU is also uh, very powerful and a terrific partner to the United States. Um, but in terms of individual nations, uh, we increasingly look to Berlin. We've had that continuity. But she has also, Chancellor Merkel, has had a personal relationship with this president. And that matters. Uh, they have had their ups and downs. They've had their differences. But despite all that, they're both very pragmatic. They enjoy each other's worldview. They enjoy being challenged. They trust each other, even despite the fact that we've had these deep disagreements over NSA surveillance. There's something that's still rock solid about that relationship and, in fact, is stronger than a lot of the other relationships that the president has around the world. So 
the real question, I guess, for the United States and Germany is, what does this relationship going forward if we have two leaders that don't get along at all, that can't connect, and if there's competition from somebody else in Europe? I suspect the U.S.-German relationship will remain very strong, um, but there's something about the Obama-Merkel dynamic that has really brought added value. It's interesting, too, when you think about it, that she will probably now have the opportunity to have served with three different presidents, um, which is continuity in its own right yeah. uh, for Germany in itself. Okay, so let, let, let's see if we can recap here a minute. I mean, right now we're looking at a relationship, as I tried to say before, that was called at that point in 89 when the Germany divided partnership and leadership. Now we're looking at leaders in partnership, which always it does, doesn't mean that there's absolutely a seamless web of interests. but. In the end, I think you used an interesting expression, we're all rowing in the same direction. That requires a sense of, of direction, but it also requires a sense of rhythm. Um, the, the, thing, the thing that I think that at the end of the day we're looking at is 25 years ago, that was probably on the steps of the Reichstag on the 3rd of October, the apex of German-American relations of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. all right? Now we are into this 21st century where the world is looking increasingly more difficult to manage. And yet, there's one pole in Europe that I think really does mean something in terms of continuity, and I think in dedication to the concept of Europe, which is, I think, under duress at the moment. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So the reason why we need to have this bilateral strength? Yeah, we need Germany not only for our own bilateral relationship, but we certainly need Germany for Germany's place in Europe and its relationship inside the EU. It is a driving force both inside the European Union and in the transatlantic relationship. There's no denying that. And so going forward, we're going to continue to rely on Berlin as a signal to us about how the winds are blowing in Europe and how we can cooperate with the Europeans. But we're going to look to them also as the kind of the root and the foundation of the transatlantic relationship. We're going to have to prioritize. We're going to have to have a strategy and we're going to have to maintain strategic attention. It will not be easy, but I think if there's any partner that we can work with in that sense, it's going to be Berlin. And I think at the end of the day as well that Germany and Berlin have a vested interest in making sure that as they do it with us, that that also expands into a European platform because we need not only Germany, but we need the entire 28. And the entire 28 is not just the EU, it's also NATO. Yeah, the strength of the relationship resides in the partnership between Europe and the United States. If it's only a handful of European countries working with the United States, that doesn't carry the same weight and strength as we've seen, for example, on our unity on sanctions policy vis-a-vis -vis Russia. I mean, we're strongest when we all stand united. So to the degree that Berlin can help us maintain that unity, all the better. And we'll be counting on them to do that. Yeah. I mean, my sense is always that, you know, you can't always go back and, um, in, in effect, look at a narrative that described German-American relations in 1948 with the Berlin Airlift, nor can you do it in 1961 when the wall went up. We almost need to redefine the narrative, but the things that are happening around us are simply encouraging us to come up with that. We just have to find a way to come up with a common language, right? That's right. We need to craft a common agenda that will allow us to preserve our values but also adjust to today's realities. And it's an overwhelming national security environment um, that's coming at us from all sides, absolutely. And so we're going to have to work double time to maintain that unity in the face of all that change. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks